I'm Tim Berg. Uh, welcome. Here we are starting on time. Uh, welcome to the Hack 100 and Radio Show number 15. I'm your host, Jim Minadio. I'm the president of Zero Surge, a manufacturer of power quality filters that are used for surge protecting sensitive electronics. With Zero Surge, you have peace of mind that your electronics are kept safe. So today we have my first public sector guest. Uh, Mark Salek is the Economic Development Director of Hunterdon County for the past two and a half years. Uh, he previously held several local and regional economic development roles in Ohio and Indiana and has been in the industry for over a decade. Uh, locally, Mark's office has launched many programs, including the Hack Hunterdon Initiative, from which this show was born, and the pending uh, economic, or was it, uh, entrepreneurial ecosystem, along with the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, I've known Mark for almost his entire tenure here in the county, yep. and I have much respect for his work ethic and how he's been able to navigate our little county with all his little fiefdoms. Um, Good so, way to put it. <laughs> and uh, today I'll uh, end the show, as always, with some historical perspective. And I think uh, I was going to run down some of the history of Hunterdon County, since you represent the county, but uh, we just celebrated our 300th year, so it's a pretty long history. So I figured for only the 10 minutes I get, uh, I'll narrow it down to the origin of the freeholder style of county government that we have. Okay. So I found this will be news to me then too. Yeah, it's it's actually kind of cool in a way how it evolved over the years. Uh, let me make sure I have your mic up. I think that's the problem with this particular number four mic has been very low. I was meaning to uh, look at the settings. Hi there, Jim. Oh, there you go. That's there we go. Okay, there we go. So I think it's just that people don't that one people don't sit, sit close enough to. I think I'm gonna hug it's it. It's a different mic than this. This is more suited for radio, I guess. Um, okay, so where was I? Okay, so that was okay. So historical. So I did that. All right. So lost my place there. Okay, so first we got to do the weather here. Uh, oh, I lost my window. They put the shade down. So it is sunny which is actually, I think we're on our fifth week in a row of good weather. Um, it's only going to be about 80, so people watching this tomorrow, you'll probably tell me what the weather really is, but uh, it's supposed to be 81 tomorrow, so that's as far as we'll go. Maybe, oh, 77 Friday, that's even better. Can I make an editorial comment on the yes. weather, Jim? Yes. It's getting way too hot next week. We're going up to like 86 or 87 again, and... We need fall to kick in, so I'm <laughs> protesting this. Well, it's not October yet. Uh, it's close enough. It's close enough. All right, well, I'm going to be hitting the – probably going down to Maryland this weekend to visit some family, so it's going to be about 90 yeah, down there. Yeah, you will be hot. <laughs> I'm thinking oh, I'm still wearing shorts and, uh, you know, getting into October. Uh, let's see. So um, that's the weather. And oh, uh, tomorrow for people, uh, if you're still watching this today or tomorrow morning, uh, we do have our – monthly meetup of the Hack 100 and meetup at the Lone Eagle Brewery. Um, again, at Bill Cheswick is our speaker. Uh, he's a computer security and networking researcher, formerly at Bell Labs. Uh, he'll be a guest speaker. Um, according to Bill, the internet is working pretty well, right? Uh, do you bank online? Uh, they're clearly major problems. So vast data spills of personal information and passwords appear in the news all the time. Espionage of all kinds is thriving. But in this very early... Uh, sorry, but it's very early in the game, and safety is not the first concern of new technologies. Bill will look at some analogous technologies and try to convince even the jaded, cynical security expert like Cody that you can and probably will get better. Uh, again, we meet the last Thursday every month at 7 p.m. at Lone Eagle on Stangle Road. So hope to see you guys out there. And Jim and I will both be there. We'll both be there. Yeah, Mark will be the one handing out the beer token. So look for Mark. And I am nowhere am I more popular than I am at <laughs> the Hack Hunter and Meetups. <laughs> yes. And we will have one on the 31st, right? We decided that's going to happen next month. Oh, is... next month? Yes. That's okay. right. So do we have a speaker? Do we have it confirmed for that? Or... We do not. Not yet. Okay. So we... to, to, Everyone sit tight. We'll get there. Okay. So uh, we'll make an announcement as soon as we get through that. Okay. So... Again, we have Mark here today, so uh, we're going to go through several topics, uh, some of them related to what he does, and then some of them related to what he likes to do. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll, do, we'll make it easy on him so it's not all business. I, um, I will start off, first of all, uh, by thanking you, Jim, for uh, launching the Hack Hunter and Radio, because it's just so nice that it's just another piece of this Hack Hunter and effort. You know, the whole thing, as you know, started off with the Hack 100 and Hackathon, mm -hmm. uh, which was terrific, and it branched off into the monthly meetups, which you continue to promote. Uh, but it was nice to get this new wrinkle to the effort. And, of course, you've been able to utilize this platform 
to drive attention to those other aspects of the initiative. And so uh, it's all worked out great, and it's nice to see the brand continue to grow and take on new permutations like this. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, so in the future guests, too, they're going to be expanding out. I mean, the first few guests were people that I knew, people that were going to the meetups, and then sprinkled in a few that had not been in the meetups before. So hopefully it helps attract more people. So we're going to try to, like uh, one example, I'm going to, go out a little bit out of the county for a couple guests. Uh, one's going to be uh, at the state level. She's going to talk about some reporting she did on innovation oh. in the state. next. That's actually next uh, week. And then um, for fun, I uh, have an astronaut that's going to be uh, by phone. Unfortunately, he won't be here, but uh, uh, somebody I knew in high school. So uh, it'll be interesting to hear his perspective on innovation. And he does a lot of science um, lectures and things like that, too. Man, he set the bar high for your whole class, didn't he? <laughs> yeah. Well, he was a year ahead of me, so yeah. He, oh, okay. You so yeah, he's, yes, he did though. Uh, for our school, that's for sure. They have, uh, from what I heard, that our high school has like you know statues of him there or whatever, you know. So it's, I'm sure they'll change the name to Terry Verts High School at some point. But. Jim, Hunter and County Economic Development is committed to helping you get that statue too. Okay. <laughs> well, we'll see. I, I don't have as. Uh, have a lot to go to get that far, uh, a few people ahead of me. But um, <laughs> all right, so I guess what we could talk about, uh, usually I like to talk with guests to kind of give everybody a background. So um, you started out, you were telling me, um, you know, you started out in other areas, you know, running businesses, you got into marketing, you got into even the radio business, and that led you into economic development. Yeah, so. most economic development directors come to the career by way of other hopefully relevant careers and that just makes sense right i mean how many of us knew that economic development was even a job possibility in high school right, right, right. no one majors in it in college what generally happens is you get expertise in other areas and then you come to it so you don't really find um 28 year old economic development directors after out there it's usually some something that people gravitate towards or stumble into and find that your skill set is perfectly suited for it. And that's what happened to me. So I did, um, even though I got a political science degree, which, by the way, completely useless, <laughs> um, I ended up in, in uh, some pretty big time restaurant management for a while uh, with some big companies and did that in the Atlanta area for quite some time. And then I did end up using my political consulting, uh, my uh, political uh, uh, science degree, and I went into political consulting. I was a lobbyist in Georgia. I uh, ran a lot of uh, associations, worked on a lot of uh, campaigns, probably 200 uh, over the course of my career in politics throughout the South. And uh, that was very interesting and helped set the stage for this to some extent. And then I was in business ownership uh, for a while. And then, like you said, I got into uh, media and mm -hmm. I was news director for a radio station and for a newspaper. And um, I started to hear about an opening for an economic development position where I was and found that my background, I thought, suited it quite well. Mm -hmm. And I applied for it. And after a long search process, I ended up getting it now. But I was already 40 when that happened. Mm -hmm. So that's what I've been doing for the last 10 years. And uh, yeah, the so nice they're, when they're looking for those jobs, they're looking for people who have business experience too right i mean they you societal would, could experience you, could you even start it out of college i mean even if you did the you, right coursework in economic development you need to understand how to handle situations and people mm -hmm. and to think on your feet during dynamic situations and so no they would not hire i mean you might hire a junior person on a staff mm -hmm. for right out of college uh but you're not going to be a director uh, in, in a lot of offices around the country, only one-man offices with the director. So for the most part, you need to have come to it after you start to get a feeling for how society works, how people work, uh, the dynamics of business and the flow of situations. Those things are all important. But the big lesson out there is that I'm someone who didn't find, finally find what they were, quote-unquote, supposed to do <laughs> until the age of 40. So for people that are out there that are still struggling in their 20s and 30s going, gosh, I just don't feel like I'm doing the right thing, it, it does happen. I was very lucky to stumble yeah. into something I was suited for late in life. Well, I think a lot of people don't realize you have to do that. Even if you think you know what you want to do, you still have to put in the time. A lot of, you know, some people, I mean, that's the one knock on, say, millennials is that they expect to get promoted after working for three years at a place, you know, because they, yeah. they can learn faster somehow magically. But it's like experience is still takes time no matter what you're doing. 
It does, and you have to make a lot of mistakes, as we all well know. So <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, um, so then, so you've been in three different economic development areas, right? You've been in Indiana, Ohio, and here. So those three different jobs were. Well, the Indiana, Ohio experience kind of blurred. Okay. Uh, and I won't bore the audience, but bottom line is economic development in New Jersey, much like a lot of things in this uh, in New Jersey, work differently than the rest of the nation, and uh, economic development plays out with more partnership among political entities and more regionalism in other areas of the country than they do here. So I was in a border community in Ohio when I was in economic development and by the very nature of the way the industry worked out there, it would mean that I would do good quality work in Indiana as well. It just doesn't work that way in New Jersey. So even though we're a border area here, we don't really do much with Pennsylvania. It's just not set up to accommodate that. Okay, so it's more the political climate, the tax climate, all these kind of things. You got it. Yeah. So somebody's going to pick one or the other for various reasons, but it's not that they're working together other than, you know, I guess uh, as an employer, you can hire somebody from PA and there's reciprocal tax things for stuff like that. But there's no, you know, nobody from PA is coming to me to try to get me to, to move zero search. Well, there, they might be, but what say. you don't get is me, unfortunately, you don't get my organization or the Mercer County organization working across the border consistently with their peers on the betterment of the area as a whole, Mm -hmm. regardless of state line. That would be nice to get to, but the system just hasn't worked that way to this point. And uh, there's a few structural changes that each state could make to allow that to happen. We'll see if that goes down. So in New Jersey, we have, so you don't uh, really collaborate with say Somerset or Mercer or Morris counties. Well, or Warren as much, or you, you'd like to. Other New Jersey counties is a little bit easier, but to be honest with you, no, that's lacking in New Jersey too. I do work somewhat with Somerset, but really not consistently at all. And with Morris, we try to, but again, there's a lot of disincentives to launching joint initiatives in this state. And, and, and on the same other side of the same coin, not a lot of incentive to, and those are two different things. Mm-hmm. So uh, the problem is that it makes it hard to weave in to what you do despite what your best intentions might be. And it's a structural problem that the state has with the way things operate, much like I'm sure a lot of listeners would would say that about a lot of other areas about the way the state op- op- operates. Economic development is no different, but that kind of gets me though to what you like to talk about on this show. And because we're so hemmed in, you really have to be innovative to get something done. It is hard to run an economic development initiative in New Jersey compared to other areas that has the ability to derive value towards communities and and businesses in your jurisdiction. Uh, So you really have to get creative. Okay, Uh, well, we're at a good stopping point then. So then we'll take a quick break and then we'll go over what things that you've tried to do uh, to innovate, you know, the process of trying to attract businesses to Hunterdon County. So uh, be right back. Folks, you know what that music is. That's the time for modern design. This blue thing is a really new trend. A lot of the designers are trying to introduce blue as a new cabinet color. This is topical for you guys. (laughs) This is really topical. And the mother said, well, I like her room to be gray. And and the little girl said, mom, gray is the color of depression. (laughs) Hi, this is Rich Scuderi of Modern Design. We're on live every Wednesday from 2 to 3, and you're listening on WHCR-DB. You're listening to WHCR-DB, HuntertonChamberRadio.com. Brought to you by the Hunterdon County Chamber of Commerce, the voice of business. Did you know that one in five people are affected by mental illness? NAMI Hunterdon is the locally affiliate for NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness. We are all volunteers, and all our programs are free of charge. We offer Family to Family, a 12-week course for families that have an adult member with mental illness. Another popular program is In Our Own Voice, where individuals who are living with mental illness discuss their challenges and their progress in overcoming those challenges. Another course we offer is Basics, a six-week course for families with a child or an adolescent who has experienced mental illness. We also have a monthly support group for families on the third Thursday of every month. Please call NAMI Hunterton at 908-284-0500 for more information about any of our programs or to join. NAMI Hunterton, the voice for mental health in Hunterton County. 
When it matters most, our award-winning team of emergency physicians and nurses provides sophisticated care 24 hours a day. Superior emergency care at a moment's notice. Hundred in health care, your the full circle that. of care. All right, we're back. Uh, Jim Minotti here with Mark Salick, the Economic Development Director of Hunterdon County. And uh, we were just leading into talking about uh, innovative ways of uh, developing the economy in Hunterdon. So uh, what was like one of the first things that you did here was the hackathon, right? Yeah, it really was. Right, and before that was the hack up, the meetup too, right? Well, it happened the before. hackathon was first. Okay. And it really does speak to innovation as to why we even went down that road in the first place. Um, as we were talking about before the break, traditional economic development is harder to run in New Jersey because of the political climate, tax and climate, the way towns interact with each other and so on and so forth. Um, so unlike when I was in Ohio or Indiana, it is much harder to say to yourself, I'm going to go out and get, you know, this Fortune 500 company to move here, or I'm going to be able to get this existing Fortune, Fortune 500 company we have here already to expand. You've got a lot less to bring to the table to get that done. You don't have the same kind of workforce programs. You don't have the same um, partnership among political and other relevant entities. You do not have the tax incentives. Um, you don't have the same climate in the state. New Jersey is notoriously known for being a difficult right. state to do um, economic business. or you know environmental regulations, Bam. startup. Even putting a sign in front of your business can be, you know, a 10-page regulation. Yes, and of course we are working on that here in Hunterdon to, to some success. But the fact is that uh, in Hunterdon we face some other challenges on top of that as well, which is most people know, you know, we're not, we don't want huge footprint projects here necessarily. That's not what the public is after. And even if you wanted to do them, you really couldn't. The infrastructure's not there, the land's not available, and so on and so forth. So. If you want to think about how you're going to contribute to the economy or how any initiative is going to contribute to the economy, you need to think differently. And so looking around and realizing in the beginning that we don't have the appetite or the capability to pull off large footprint projects, we don't have um, the kind of workforce that's going to fill a thousand person whirlpool plant. You know, we mm -hmm. don't, we're not set up well for logistics and distribution. You know, you look at it and you realize there's a lot of industries that we're just not going to get that value from right. but you know what we can get it from we can get it from the innovation sector it biosciences things like that why well let's take an it firm for example um, an it firm does not have a big pull on local resources it's just a, a lot of them are just a bunch of programmers and some instructors in an office right. so you're not using massive amounts of water uh, or, or electricity or things like that. You don't need a lot of people on the roadways. Um, but, it, it's so, but, it's a, it, but it's a clean industry. It's an industry that requires a, a, a educated and skilled workforce, which we have, right. but, it's got, but, it, um, but it's got a very light footprint and it has high wages. So what we need to sustain Hunterdon County is that model of high wage and light footprint. And that is the kind of development of the economy that would be accepted from any of our 26 towns. Mm -hmm. So in the beginning, we said to ourselves, we want to run a tech initiative. We want to encourage the companies we already have in those sectors to grow. Mm -hmm. We want to be able to encourage them to come in. Um, and we want to develop that workforce. When we first talked to companies in New York and Philadelphia and we got here about, play devil's advocate with us. Tell us why we can't succeed. Right. One of the many things, they gave us a lot of reasons, unfortunately. <laughs> But one of the reasons they gave us was that we're never going to be able to attract the kind of workforce that it will take to sustain that kind of effort long term. Now, hmm. I don't necessarily believe that, but I do believe what he said next. So he said, so you better get in touch with who you already have. And so they suggested a number of ways to pull those people out and gravitate them towards your effort in a hackathon, which is a 24-hour uh, tech product creation competition so the hackathon is a great way to do that mm -hmm. and that is essentially exactly what has happened we had that first hackathon and it pulled the tech sector out from co dark corners so to speak right. where they had been operating but they didn't know each other were around them and the town didn't know they were there and uh you know they kind of a lot of them just thought they were isolated and they were working in isolation what happened instead is we found them and they yeah. started working with each other through that and other things. We started to layer onto it, like the meetup. Yeah, and I think one of the other things to aspect too is that 
um, because a hackathon is more of a young person's kind of event. Yeah. Uh, you end up getting all the younger adults that are here that don't realize there's a bunch of other adults. Like, I mean, there's people like me who know, I know a lot of IT people that are my age, but I don't know anybody that are 20 years old or 25 years old. Oh. And so, you know, for me, I think they all live in Hoboken, you know, commuting into New York City, but they don't all do that. You know, some of them are all here. So, well, and, that, and that's, that's a perfect example of what we needed is people being aware of each other and working with each other. And Jim, with you being the owner of a business, you're a great example of that. I mean, through this economic development effort, you've connected with the tech community, but you've also discovered other companies and you've right. now gone to visit them. You engage with them. You're meeting them more because you've taken on this platform. Right. This is the kind of thing we need. We need internal synergy. So if we've got entrepreneurs, we want to connect them with each other to be able to grow here. Right. We're not going to be able to attract Facebook here right. but you know, or Google. But if somebody here has an idea for what would become the next Google sensation, we want them to grow their idea here. So that's what our economic development initiative in part became about. Right. But, and then you did end up getting a big fish. I mean, we didn't really talk about this ahead of time, but you, yeah. I mean, you did get a really big fish in the IT world. That's a good point. We did. You Unicom know? Global came in, again, a worldwide IT company, as the name would imply, and they came in and they purchased the old Merck headquarters in Reddington Township, uh, White House spa Station specifically. And uh, they've grown slowly at that site, but they have a lot of big plans for that campus, and they are a company with deep, deep resources and a worldwide operation. And so that along with just down the corridor there on 78, along with the expansion of that Exxon R&D facility, which by the right. way, has 436, I think, laboratories in it. Wow. Those two bookends on that, uh, on 78 there, almost give us our own little tech corridor to a certain extent. Right, I mean, that's what, I mean, it, you know, having Unicom come helps even the smaller companies say, okay, well, if Unicom can work here, why can't I do something here? It, it speaks a lot to the talent base that exists here. and. Again, we have those limitations I talked about earlier, mm -hmm. but the one thing we don't have a limitation on is brain power. Uh, this is an extremely skilled and talented workforce in and around the Hunterdon area, and it gives us the ability to market ourselves as a tech hub, I believe. Okay, so then where where does the next, so the next step, we've had the hackathon, we've had three hackathons, and so we've kind of evolved that, and I think we're talking about moving it to more of a high school level event and then get into more of an entrepreneurial type event but then also you're we're tying this into a larger entrepreneurial um system you know like i was saying uh offline is that you know the government's very good at training people uh for for jobs uh there's a lot of training centers around new jersey uh and jmp there's apprenticeships there's all these things going on but there's no entrepreneurial training center and so that's something that that you guys are working on yeah so again getting that spirit of wanting to make sure we're, we're growing the talent we've got from within partnering with that talent so that we keep them again we don't want somebody like you said earlier we don't have someone with a great idea to think they have to move to hoboken to make it happen right. we want it so we want to put in tools to capture um and partner long term now the Hack Hunter and platform through all those permutations you talked about, including this radio show, is a great tool for that because it creates it creates that culture locally and it creates synergy among that culture. But that's not the same thing as giving them a hand up um, if they decide to grow their idea locally. So um, the Chamber of Commerce and Hunterdon County Economic Development are working together to create a local innovation entrepreneurialism system. And for those listeners that don't know, the Hunterdon County Economic Development Office is housed even though it's not under the chamber we are we coexist with the chamber in the in their building to help us facilitate working together on these things but we really want to put together a system which has advanced mentor networks for some of these companies startup companies companies going from stage one to stage two anyone looking to grow that needs input um, mm -hmm. we want to put a mentor together network together we want to have an angel investor group we want to uh, be able to have um, access to resources, co-working space, all those kind of things that a company would need to be able to help grow long-term. We would like to have a full-scale incubator. In the meantime, we at least want to put together some kind of a virtual incubation system. Mm -hmm. And the key to that still ties back to this Hack Hunterdon platform because that culture of technology and innovation that exists now can help that next wave come up. Right. And I'll do a quick plug too, just to make sure people really understand that um, 
the Huntington County Chamber of Commerce has a second building out back on their campus and they are turning that into the Unity Bank Center for Business and Entrepreneurialism. I mm -hmm. hope I didn't butcher that title too much. I think but that's what it is. I think I at least got yeah. close. <laughs> Well, we got the important thing is the sponsor. Unity Bank is the sponsor. Correct. Sponsor was, after that, it was just blah, blah, blah. Yeah. <laughs> but they, uh, there are some of these activities we're talking about, including that entrepreneurial training you talked about, right. already is slated to occur out in that building. So the building. Well, they already have there. a leadership training program. Right. So they have more of a generic leadership. So it's not necessarily taking a company from scratch and moving it, but they do have this culture of trying to create leadership within the county. So that's like the next level above that. Nice piece be, to it, yes. Yeah, so, yep. so they have that already as a base. And the next thing we want to do is make something that's, you know, for the person who's going to be the founder of a company. You know, how do you get them to go from founder to hiring people? Correct. And that's what we want. And, you know, so I can't get into all the details on all these things, but there's going to be a lot of programs and initiatives in this system that are essentially designed to make sure that we hold on to our innovators so that they contribute long term to this local economy. And that's the key. Economic development doesn't necessarily mean building things. It means building the economy. Right. And this is one of those uh, initiatives, this overall initiative that is going to help us do that long term. Right. And I think the other thing to mention that people should know about what you do isn't all tech, too, because we also have this agricultural uh you know history as a you know a country kind of county and you know a lot of horse farms a lot of uh you know we have the egg farms famous here and stuff like that artisan and food so, and beverage production right yeah. so i mean you still get involved with those kind of uh companies and try to attract them here too like you have certain uh, growing operation that may happen in reddington right is that that's official because that made the news that is in the news, yes. So is the, that official then or that is not official still proposed in any way that I okay. can talk about anyway, oh, okay. but it's um, if anyone who saw the article, that part is public now that the old Walmart site on twenty two may become a medical marijuana uh, growing facility. Just growing, not distributing, right. uh, no local uh, dispensary. Um, so that fits into a couple things, frankly, in terms of economic development. It is an agricultural project product. It is reuse of a stranded asset, and it is, if the article is portraying it correctly, a, a large number of pretty well-paying jobs as well. They're talking about 100 people. Yep. You know, so it's like a perfect kind of uh, thing for us to get into, even though, you know, maybe some people have some issues with it, but uh, from, a, you know, from the issue with marijuana and stuff. But, you know, but even here we have a lot of uh, wineries. We have a lot of these breweries now. We have a lot of even distilleries. And even a lot of art programs. I mean, there's some things that I know that you're working on even related to that. To, so it's it's not just that we're trying to create Silicon Valley here. No. It's that we also are looking at the, uh, you know, he also looks at the other stuff like the arts even and uh, um, some of the economics that we can develop out of that too. So. And, and that's important to note because, Jim, because you're right, because innovation occurs in every sector. Uh, so it doesn't need to be limited to technology per se. And a matter of fact, you, of course, you know yourself that where we host our meetups is the Lone Eagle Brewery. And the owner of that actually employs, you know, innovation and just even how he creates his product. Right. And he's not the only um, artisan food and beverage producer in Hunterdon that has an innovative approach to what they do. So innovation is industry agnostic, without a doubt. Right. And that's part of what the show is even, you know, it's I want to bring people who do, not just IT people. So like some future uh, guests. Uh, another guest we're going to have is a company that does um, uh, employee assistance programs. So they're out of Lambertville and uh, met them at a chamber event and they're going to come up and talk about the innovation. Like I started talking about the show and they, were, they really thought about it and said, you know, yeah, we do have innovation even in our field because we, you know, 20 years ago we didn't have computers. We didn't have phones. Now if we have a natural disaster you know, the big company that they work for will, will, you know, say, hey, we have this disaster in this location. Can you manage the communication with all the employees so they know what building to go to, ah. you know, what kind of uh, services they can have, you know, if their office was destroyed in a natural disaster or something, you know, this is where you go to get your computer, or, you know, or whatever. So it's like, um, you know, that's stuff they couldn't have done 20 years ago. Yeah, there really can be so innovation in anything. You know, getting back to a comment you made earlier about, uh, everyone being in their own fiefdom in New Jersey, 
um, through this effort, one of our initiatives, um, again, to move it away from tech, is um, the Economic Development Office has organized a 7822 coalition, mm -hmm. which is all of our communities that touch either of those two corridors uh, sit on a committee that meets fairly regularly to vet uh, opportunity that is ubiquitous across the corridor uh, to address common challenges and to share information with each other and ideas. And to be honest with you, obviously this is not innovation in other places, but in mm -hmm. New Jersey, in, in 100 That's a government season. innovation right there, like yeah. having more than one town actually talk to each other and coordinate. And we've got nine that's, doing that. That's crazy. In conjunction yeah. with the county, which, you know, can be in some cases even more rare. Right. So you can innovate anywhere, and this economic development effort continues, whether it's the way it interacts with business, the way it organizes, the way it um, interacts with its towns, we are trying to think of new ways to contribute. And there's big payoffs with that because what happens is when towns look at common problems, they end up trying to, they end up focusing on creating common solutions. And we do, for example, have a little wave going through Hunter Inn right now of communities that are looking at um, their ordinances and their policies and their procedures and really looking at them and deciding is there anything here that is unnecessarily cumbersome or expensive or would in any, would in any way discourage investment in our community? Something that's holding us back as a community because, yeah. you know, there's, there's, the, there's always a group of people who say, you know, not in my backyard or I don't want to, I don't want things to change, but it's not even about that. It's no. even, you know, to even be able to fix problems that they complain, those same people complain about. Or maybe because there's a regulation that prevents it from being fixed. Or as you said off air, even something as simple as putting a sign in yeah. can be, especially if you're a mom and pop in some communities throughout New Jersey, can be a draining, expensive process. And so we had one town recently was looking at some things, and they have a uh, an ordinance on one particular area, which I won't go into detail because I don't want to out them, so to speak. <laughs> but they had four pages on this thing. And they end up reducing it to three paragraphs, which eased the burden on all their existing merchants. And they, I asked them how they managed to do that. And they said, well, we looked at it and we looked at it through one of these programs we were talking about. Mm -hmm. And they said, we came to the conclusion it didn't make any sense. Right. <laughs> so you're trying to move, remove things like that as barriers to growth, uh, where reasonable and appropriate to do so. And so again, innovation that's occurring in Hunter Inn is towns realizing we can become partners with our investors long term and still keep the character of our communities. So a lot of work is going on in that area as well. Yeah, yeah, that's really cool stuff. Um, all right, so we're at another break here. Um, let's see, I guess. Um, I'm trying to get my finger here on which ad I have to run. Do that first, and then as promised to Mark, we'll talk uh, non-economic development. We'll talk uh, science fiction development. and uh, Good stuff. <laughs> all right, be right back. Folks, you know what that music is. That's the time for modern design. This blue thing is a really new trend. A lot of the designers are trying to introduce blue as a new cabinet color. This is topical for you guys. <laughs> this is really topical. And the mother said, well, I'd like her room to be gray. And, and the little girl said, mom, gray is the color of depression. <laughs> Hi, this is Rich Scuderi of Modern Design. We're on live every Wednesday from 2 to 3, and you're listening on WHCR-DB. You're listening to WHCR-DB, HuntertonChamberRadio.com. Brought to you by the Hunterdon County Chamber of Commerce, the voice of business. For over 50 years, Hunterdon Medical Center has been a leader in delivering comprehensive medical and health services to our community. Our staff is committed to providing the highest quality of care to our patients. If you need a physician, we can refer you to over 300 of the best. Call Hunterdon Medical Center's Physician Referral Service at 1-800-511-4HMC or visit us on the web at www.hunterdonhealthcare.org. When it matters most, our award-winning team of emergency physicians and nurses provide sophisticated care 24 hours a day. Superior emergency care at a moment's notice. Hundred and Health Care, your full circle of care. All right, we're back. Uh, Jim and Audio and Mark Salik here talking about economic development. But uh, right now, as promised, we're going to talk about science fiction because that is uh, Mark's 
a passion, I guess. Well, uh, one of them, pa- anyway. One of his uh, passions. Lifelong. Yeah, so uh, I promised he could talk about science fiction. I, I <laughs> Myself, I grew up that way, and then I kind of lost my way into the world of more comedies and other things like that. So uh, he's probably more up on it than I am, but uh, I do love a good science fiction movie or or story. So that's, uh, you know, so I guess the first question is uh, we have to go over your credentials as a sci-fi fan. So <laughs> Doctor Who. Oh, yeah. Right? Um, all, early Star Trek. The original series over uh, the uh, any of the new ones, frankly, to me. And especially because okay. it was, so, speaking of innovation, that was an innovative show. Okay, so none of the new ones, though. Not none of, just not over. Not over, okay. Um, yeah, the next generation, definitely good stuff, great characters. Uh, if I was going to pick a captain of a ship, I'd probably still go with Picard over Kirk. But I will always pick original series in terms of, um, you know, the way they wrote their characters, how ahead of, ahead of the time they were, um, the complexity of some of the stories, and most importantly for any work of fiction, character development. It's in such a short time, too, because they only yeah. had three years. Yeah, they did things that, uh, like, from an engineering and innovation standpoint, was all based on... I mean, the fact that we're still trying to create weapons that stop people without hurting them yep. is from Star Trek. The phaser is the reason why police departments have a taser. That's right. I mean, that's exactly what it is. It even looks like it. Yep. I mean, it's just crazy. And the a whole, con- and the medical stuff too, right? All the, you know, the little, the recorders and the little, uh, you know, the fact that you could just scan somebody's body without, that's the, that's the inspiration for an MRI machine. Yeah. Except, you know what? I was watching one the other day and I'm looking at the, the, that tricorder and yeah. some of those other devices bones used. And if, for the science fiction fans out there, look at that next time you're watching. Great. I believe within the context of the show that the device can do everything they say it, it does. But how is Bones absorbing that information? There's no readout. There's no printout. There's no wire connected to anything else. He just looks at it with no display, and he somehow is getting tons of information. So <laughs> it might be a little flaw we found in that. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's just, just projecting right it. right to a chip in his brain. Well, yeah, yeah exa- <laughs> obviously. But clearly, yes. <laughs> well, Uhura had always the hear piece, so maybe he had one. We just didn't see it. Perhaps he had one mic- micro implanted into his ear, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, the one bit of technology, though, that I don't want to use, everything in that I would use, the one thing I don't have any interest in being teleported anywhere, oh. I do not trust somebody to put together a device that disintegrates me and then re- reanimates you. <laughs> me. That's right. <laughs> yeah, I'm surprised they never had more accidents with that. Well, it gets philosophical, too. Do you die and are recreated in a perfect, you know, a perfect imitation? Maybe the, all those characters are dying and being recreated hundreds of times. There, how would you know? Yeah, and I always wondered the. I mean, the rules. Uh, I guess some of the, the problem was when I, when all these other movies started coming out that are like uh, pseudo science fiction, but they're really like the comic book ones. It's the whole concept of, you know, the physics never adds up. Like, I can, you know, su- like even say the the latest, uh, the re- reincarnation of Superman. Like he has the fight with Zod at the end. And they can like throw each other through buildings. Nothing damages them, but as soon as he gets mad enough, he can kill him by, you know, twisting his neck. Yeah, I know superhero you know, movies like, tend to get classified. So in science do they get thrown these into days, that? But no. Yeah, so like a true science fiction is more, you know, a concept of yes of what's gonna what could happen. The with, Matrix is science fiction. It is concept driven storytelling. Whereas um, something like uh, Star Wars, and I know a lot of fans, it's that actual hardcore science fiction people, yes, it's science fiction in the sense that there are um, elements that, that drive the story that is technology that hasn't been created yet. But the concepts that are driving the story are pedestrian, human, earthly concepts, um, unlike The Matrix where the entire story is being driven by a piece of technology. So uh, Star Wars is classified to me and other hardcore science fiction fans as space opera and not, you know, So where does the line? So, so that's, yeah, I mean, that's, it's not a story you discuss at the end, like when the movie's over. For the first time watching Star Wars, it wasn't, oh, that's a cool concept that a kid can be an orphan and then become a, a Jedi Knight. It's yeah. more that, oh, it was cool that they made lightsabers work. Right, right. So it was more of a science fiction. It was more like, 
the tools of the storytelling were advanced, not the storytelling itself. Yeah, right. It was more about the way they presented it on screen and the special effects. And there were some neat inventions in there. But again, right. it wasn't a it wasn't a concept-driven story. Simple as that. Right. Now, I do not want to um, denigrate the franchise, you know, even though I personally think it ran out of steam a long time ago. But the original Star Wars itself was incredible. But if you're talking about your great science fiction movies, you're talking about Matrix... You're talking about Blade Runner. Right. Um, you're talking about even something like 12 Monkeys, which uh, the Terry Gilliam yeah. film that a lot of people might be familiar with. So. Yeah, yeah. That's the, is that the one with uh, Brad Pitt? Uh, Bruce Willis and, Brad, Brad and Pitt. Brad Pitt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And uh, what was the woman? Um, Madeline, Madeline Stowe, Stowe, right? Yeah, okay, yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I, I have way too much of this <laughs> up in my head. But on TV... Uh, Doctor Who is more science fiction, getting back to what you said, than Star Trek is, for the same reasons we talked about. Doctor Who's, the concepts that drive the story are all, um, are all uh, uh, innovation or technology driven uh, or foreign concepts to Earth. They're not just things in it, they're driving the story. And so that's where the line is. And and I always found growing up that Doctor Who had so many incredible concepts that shaped the story that I couldn't stop watching. Star Trek, you couldn't stop watching either, but for different reasons. Was it reasons. because of the time travel? So, like, you know, in Star Trek, they didn't time travel. So it's like everything always has to happen in their version of today. So they can never really advance the story past today or tomorrow in their world, right? It, it, and maybe yeah. that's the difference with Doctor Who. You can kind of go to different eras, Right. Well, I mean, that was that's... that was part of it, but they also it's also the regeneration. Uh, and for Doctor yeah. Who fans, you know, we're talking about the regeneration yeah. of the. That's a central f driving feature of it is the fact that the main character can regenerate. You don't have Doctor Who without that. It would have stopped being on the air forty five years ago. Yeah. So the main character can regenerate, which is a science concept. The TARDIS itself, which was the mode of transportation, it wasn't just that it could time travel. My God, the thing, the whole concept of the main place where stuff is shot throughout the show being a structure where it's larger on the inside than the, than the outside. I mean, you're just introducing so many science fiction concepts that are actually structuring the framework of the storytelling. It's, it, they're, they're, they're littered in every second of the, of the piece. Oh, so I've always wanted to ask you, uh, do you think Quantum Leap is just a, an Americanized cheap version of Doctor Who? Well, let me put it like this. <laughs> I never finished a single episode. <laughs> <laughs> I know okay. I'm coming off, coming off like a sci-fi snob. But yeah, I am one. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, so it's it's. I mean, I always thought of that. It was almost like because it kind of came around right after Doctor Who was starting to be shown on PBS in the U.S. and it kind of like, point. I always wondered if that was like a cheap knockoff. Like, oh, we'll make something like this, but something that Americans can just palate. You know, you know that'll that'll they'll take in. That's know. a good point. You know, by the way, don't even get me started on Knight Rider. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that was just a cop show. That's right. With technology. With technology added. I mean, to it. that really isn't no different than, uh, but RoboCop. Oh. No, that's technology, but there's the concept that the man and the robot are the one, you know, and then at the end he has to, she he remembers who he is, kind of thing. So I would say that's a little bit more science fiction, but if you're gonna go Paul Verho Verhoeven movies. Um, you don't want to forget Total Recall. Okay. Uh, the original one. That was, um, it's a little bit more space opera, but it was, it's worth mentioning just because it was so well done uh, as, as a piece. But yeah. Yeah, I still think of that movie too. Uh, that was a, that definitely was a good movie. Um, and then my, like my son's favorite movie of all time is 2001, A Space oh. Odyssey. So he's, you know, he took me, they remastered it and shown it in 70 millimeter in a, uh, theater in new york so we had to drive over there one day it is uh definitely something you if you could do that see it in 70 millimeter now according to the way i've defined great science fiction you're right it is you want to talk about a concept driven movie yeah it's it, all concept it, it ties in earth's deep past with its present and connects it to the future while connecting it to every other place in the universe simultaneously i mean you don't get bigger in terms of concepts except again maybe the matrix so or even interstellar maybe a little bit yeah that's a good point i too. mean i like interstellar for that concept that it talks it's kind of circular too that he comes back around and then to see his kid grown up yeah you know so it's kind of like that concept too that it can take a whole lifetime to find somebody that's kind of like what i thought the little 
tagline should be underneath the movie, you know. And actually, you know, that that's a great point, too. And that's an, another thing that Doctor Who re- does really well, which take these huge life concepts and sometimes incorporate them with this technological storytelling. Uh, by the way, though, getting away from just sci-fi, there's some great, you know, other other frameworks that are really enjoyable are things that take you outside of reality. They're not they're not um, they're not sci-fi by any stretch, but they're fantastical uh, scenarios that still incorporate real world human emotion. And, you know, some people call it fantasy, but there's other mm-hmm. permutations that a great show right now on NBC is entering its last season which you can now binge on on Netflix. And I just did that. It's called The Good Place. Oh, yes. Oh, that is oh, one of my favorite. Isn't that amazing? Yes. that uh, the, And that's one of those shows you have to watch the first season without ever having somebody spoil that. Because it's one of those definitely, it'll definitely, you watch the first season, second season, whatever, but then watch the first season again knowing it's not the same. Yes. By the way, that's a great support statement for binging because yeah. if you binge at least a couple of seasons or something before you tell anyone about it just less of a chance yeah. they can ruin it for you <laughs> yeah that one that one uh we got on that one right away because my wife's a big fan of ted danson and i love the um you know Kristen bell and uh the other the the lady that plays janet i've seen her in other things and she's she's also in that show barry yeah yeah um uh it's fun fact she was uh Bill Hader's nanny. Oh, no kidding, really? Before she before she was an actress and trying to get acting gigs, she ended up uh, meeting him and, and working for him. She needs to be nominated for an Emmy for that, I think, for supporting. I think she She's was. Like, was she? she yeah, okay. she was. Actually. I'm pretty sure she was. It was pretty weird, the Emmys this year. I looked at some of the... I was looking through the list of the winners and stuff, but there's so many people... There's too many shows that had three or four people nominated for the same show for the same role. Right. So it's like they're obviously going to split the vote, you know, so it, it seems like a silly thing. I don't think anybody won for except maybe place. Peter Dinklage, oh. who, who is where you had three or four people within the, the same, same show, show yeah. nominated in the same category. Well, for the type of person I think in general, not that I want to typecast your audience, yeah. but for the kind of people who are going to be listening to your show, yeah. I bet you – almost all of them to a, to a person would like the good place oh yes definitely and then what's the show on um, the the amazon one with the books i can't remember the good good versus evil or whatever the the one with the angels and demon oh uh, good omens good omens that's it yeah yeah and you know i know you were a fan i of watched that. that i watched that whole thing that was really i liked it and of course david tennant is that and david tennant was a doctor who yeah, yeah so i i started watching it for that reason i actually got distracted and i haven't gotten back on that one yet but i i know that everyone loved the book and you've heavily endorsed the series so i'm gonna get yeah it's definitely worth scene. watching i think they just do, it's just well made yeah i mean it's they're definitely spared no expense uh it's not you know it's not like say the good place they don't need to spend the money on the the set design. The set yeah. design. Well, they do in a way because they do, but, but they don't do much on uh, special effects. Right. Whereas, you know, the other one you have with the omens, you have to have a little bit better quality of costume and makeup and all that other stuff for it to be more like what you would think the book should be. And I think it, they do a good enough job as far as that. I mean, it's, that's an impossible job to do, uh, even when you have that many episodes to portray a book. But still, it's a it's a good show. I know I keep telling everything back to Doctor Who, but that's actually one of the reasons that show is so great because obviously, and you said you started watching it or you only watch it in the 70s. Yeah. So you know, as well as anyone, that they created engaging stories with a $17.95 budget for, yeah. for each production. So you want to talk about having to get creative and innovative. Yeah, but back then, that was you could get away with that. I mean, that's the thing. <laughs> Try to do that today, even in today's dollars. I mean, that's, uh, I mean, that's pretty... I mean, The Good Place probably comes as close as you can to do science fiction on a lower budget than yeah. without having to have all these space scenes and special effects and things like that. But, you know, for people that don't like science fiction because they don't consider it realistic, you know, if, if you go back and you look at a lot of science fiction from 30, 40 years ago, a lot of it is reality now. You know, so I don't really look at now. Look, if you, you get into the most more advanced concepts you know, like traveling between galaxies. That's obviously not something that's going to happen in the next 50, 100, even 500 years. But right. um, a lot of them are really just windows into the future. And you want to, again, get back to that theme of innovation. It's really a great skill to be able to look at the world around us today and make reasonably accurate predictions as to where trends will lead us to in terms of technology. And, and in cases like Blade Runner, how society will operate. Because 
society these days especially changes. Cultures change, the way people interact change, inter, uh, uh, change. The way entire societies are driven is now governed to a large extent by technology. Right. You know, so the fact you're writing these stories where technology is driving where humanity is going in terms of culture, whereas in things like 1984 in Brazil, they seemed far-fetched, now seems like there yeah, might not be true. any other way to think about it. Exactly. I mean, that's the thing. It's like uh, having technology be a guide, but, but science fiction and these kind of um, you know, movies in general, I mean, even space travel, you could say you just need that as a way to be able to say, okay, we're going to take you to a different world like they're going to take you out of this container and put you in and then we're going to make it so that you know uh they worship a cup of water instead so we're going to we're going to do that and i i love taking movies that like take the rules of life or the rules of physics even and say okay we're going to do this this and this to it or we're going to put you in this kind of government or this kind of group of people and then just play around with them in this little laboratory yeah. and that's what kind of what space travel to me is like okay it's it takes it's a way to make sure you know we're not talking about this is what's happening now but this is what could happen but yeah and as a thought exercise it really does lend itself to creative thinking and has you know that that has to the kind of creative thinking that has real world implications for entrepreneurs or anyone else who's trying to take a different approach to something in life so i do think good science fiction in that way becomes a practical endeavor although i know a lot of people think that's a reach it's the the, the thinking skills have carryover. Okay. All right. Great. Um, see, we got about five minutes left. So, uh, as I promised, I always have this historical story at the end. Um, so, we're talking about the history of Hunterdon County. As uh, your, I guess your direct boss is not the freeholder, right? You work for the planning department. No, 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 no. Are I you, work directly to. For the, I report direct. I mean, let's let me because we're talking to the public. Let me be perfectly clear. Yeah. The way this office conducts itself we work for the towns and for the businesses but we do get a paycheck from the hundred and county freeholders <laughs> right i mean you have some boss that yes. signs your check <laughs> that's <Yeah>. correct <laughs> right so you worked right so the freeholders so i figured this was um a good topic to talk about for the history of uh freeholders so um i mean maybe if you grew up here you probably learned this in school but i didn't so i didn't know this uh, and i didn't grow up here and so. they don't have freeholders in maryland so um you know even what the term freeholder meant i've, I've asked people around here and they don't always know so um, basically, it really meant that you were free from being held uh, liable to somebody else financially. So basically, a freeholder was somebody who had property rights. So you could not be a freeholder unless you owned your own property. So if you were living above the inn, you know, in a room and you're paying rent, you can never be the freeholder. So in a way, it was a way, it's, it's something that the English started um, as a way of trying to you know, say, okay, well, we'll let the commoner be in charge of other commoners, but, you know, maybe not, you know, so it's kind of like, it's a way for people to think that they're being, uh, you know, run by people who are um, free to do whatever they wanted, but it was more that they were free of any liabilities to other people. Well, it creates a lot of confusion for me when I travel, because everywhere in the nation, people are used to saying county commissioner, yeah. I have to say county freeholder and then explain myself. Right. And so, in fact, when it started, too, it was the justice of the peace who joined with the chosen freeholders in forming the board. Mm. So you actually had peace officers, basically like the sheriff, basically, would be the equivalent today. So it'd be like if the sheriff and the freeholders were on the same board. And um, so back, let's see, so... Uh, da, 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 where is it? Okay, so as um, there used to be two freeholders were chosen from each municipality in the government, in the county. So, uh, you know, we have how many towns? 26. So imagine we had 52 freeholders. That's too many. Right. So, <laughs> um, so they abolished, uh, in 1798, they abolished the board um, with, the, with the peace officers. And then they had a, peace, uh, a board of chosen freeholders of only one elected representative from each municipality in the county uh, who assumed the powers and jurisdiction of the old board. So early on, they said, okay, this is going to be ridiculous having two. So they did went down to one, which is still, you know, 26 people would be pretty ridiculous. Um, and they didn't change that until 1902. Uh, the state legislature allowed a county to change the composition of its freeholders from one member in each town and township to three to nine. Um, 
members elected at large. So basically, up until 1902, we still had, if we had 26 towns, we had 26 members in the freeholders. It's more recently than, than I would have thought. Yeah, so, I mean, imagine, you know, just trying to get 26 people to agree on something or you had to get at least, you know, 14 to agree on something. I mean, let alone here, you have to only need three, right? There's well, six. So I don't think they like three four. to two votes, but yeah, I mean, yeah, three is all you need, though, technically. Yeah, I mean, so, you know, you could at least move things forward, but that was uh, ridiculous. So they did change it in 1902. Um, let's see. So, oh, some famous freeholders uh, you have. William Trent, who Trenton is named after him, he was a freeholder. Uh, Philip Ringo's, which obviously Ringo's is named after him. Uh, he was an early trader and settler in Amwell. Uh, and then a bunch of military people from the Revolutionary War. Uh, John uh, Mehelm, Mehelm, or, uh, Thomas Lowry, uh, Isaac Smith, uh, David Shomp. Those were all Revolutionary War uh, people. And I guess we have the one uh, signer of the Declaration of Independence uh, was John Hart, was a freeholder in Hunterdon County. Huh. And one U.S. Senator, John Lambert, which I'm surprised there hasn't been more U.S. Senators that have been freeholders. Yeah, actually, I'm surprised by that, too. So uh, I guess that's probably state that, that goes to our kind of very country nature, too. So somebody, you know, a politician coming out of Hunterdon probably isn't well known statewide to be able to run at state senator because you know he's going to get outvoted by all the larger populations yeah i'm sure it, it, it has happened and can still happen but yeah you've got an uphill fight compared to other areas for sure i mean now you can because of the way you can you know become famous very quickly nowadays but i imagine you know 30 years ago you know if you, people didn't know you in newark or camden who's going to vote for you yeah but usually these days if people are becoming famous very quickly it's not for the right reason so uh the other thing too is about freeholders up until uh, seven, I guess as of 1792, uh, they were only paid, uh, oh, they weren't paid up until 1792. So, you know, they had freeholders for, you know, about a hundred years before that, uh, about 80 years before that they were, they actually worked for free. Freeholders in this state might say the same thing still. <laughs> <laughs> but they, they, did, they, uh, raised their pay up to six pence per meeting as expense for their attendance. What's a pence? <laughs> He's a vi vice president. Oh. <laughs> that's, no, a, no. that's as good as ending no. to the show as any. <laughs> yeah, that's a great way to end. Uh, it's like, what's the matter with you? What's the matter with you? All right. <laughs> what movie is that from? Uh, that's a song, not okay. a movie. Okay, that's what it is. All right. Um, yeah, I guess we were running out of time here, so I guess I should end the show. Um, all right, so thanks to Mark for being here. Uh, thanks to all the fans listening on YouTube and uh, Facebook. Uh, again, the show archives on Facebook, and then I move a copy of it over to YouTube for people who aren't on Facebook. Um, thanks to the Chamber for giving me the opportunity and the platform. Yes. Uh, Mark and his team of economic development. Thank you. You, uh, you know, including uh, Mary and uh, Ross. Um, and then do you have another... On your website, you you list Tara as a contributor, but I guess yes, but she's not officially in this office. Oh, okay, correct. yeah. Uh, the gang back at Zero Surge: Donna, Deb, Jen, Tony, Dave, and John. Uh, thanks to my wife Debbie and kids Nicholas and Cora, and to the rest of you innovators out there. The original meaning of innovator was that you're a rebel, so keep rebelling against the doubters and make your ideas a reality. Goodbye. <laughs>